This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Dave McDonald. I'm Nate Blyton. I'm Sam Merciers. And this week we are without a guest again. Hopefully we'll be back with a guest next week. But until then, you're going to listen to some headlines and you're going to like it. Because that's what we did when I was your age. And we liked it then too. Because then we only had rocks and we had to pretend that the rocks were the internet and we made pretend that that internet had podcasts on it and we were making one sam remembers that though sam's yeah. sam's a little older than me we had to walk to our internet and it was uphill both ways that's right <laughs> i hear the bandwidth wasn't so good either right the band was was not good you know what so <laughs> that was really awkward. Sorry. We're gonna we're gonna well, start camera was reading. Say what? I didn't know I was on camera, I'm reading. Somebody's gotta know what they're talking about on this show. I know. It's a problem. Uh we actually had some good news this week. Hey. We don't often have a lot of good news on Sound Notion because we talk about, you know, organizations that are going away. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there's not really a lot of good news for the arts. Lots of lots of people trying to. I just read last week uh, that uh, one one of uh, Mitt Romney's budget proposals is to eliminate na the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, so I have no comment on that. This is not a politics show. Sam will tell you more <laughs> on Twitter. Um, but we do have some good news because um, there there are more organizations that are getting behind saving the Charles Ives home uh, in Reading, Connecticut. We talked about this on the show last week that um, the there's a development company that wants to buy the space that the uh, historic Charles Ives home is on and turn it into we imagine a Starbucks or a shopping center of some kind, perhaps a, a lovely condo development and uh, get rid of all of the wonderful history that's there. Um, and so there, we're, we're getting m more and more uh, attention for this, this issue. It's hard because it's Ives and it's not Copeland, right? If it were Copeland, it would be easy. But um, we're, we're, we are getting places. What's the story here, Sam? Since well, you've been reading and somebody needs to know what we're talking about. Well, it's funny. There's this is it's a non-story really because they said they're they're announcing their plan to come up with a plan to save the house. Yes, so this they're is... announcing a future announcement. We, and you said this wasn't a politics show, but that's like right out of the politics playbook, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, or, you know what else is out of the playbook of is uh, tech companies like Apple is going to announce that they're having an announcement for the new iPhone. <laughs> Right. Yeah. So that's exactly. the kind of thing that we get in technology all the time. So, like Sam <laughs> so, said, new, news might have been a bit of a stretch, but it's good to see that there are are, are people who are trying to put their weight behind uh, saving the home of one of the most important American composers. Um, and it's going to so take. Any, a, so what? So, so if anybody has an extra hundred or one point five million, send it over to the Ives Society. They should sure use it to save that house. That's right. Right. Certainly a house worth saving if if you know it's it's hard to say that there's a ton of value to just this physical space. Um but I think historically I I would want to have the opportunity to visit a, a house like that. Sure. Wouldn't you? <clears throat> one of the one of the issues they raise in the article is that it's in a what is now a community of quote McMansions. Yeah. So it looks very out of place because it's a quaint little, you know, New England cottage kind of place and it's you know, surrounded by the starter mansions. Yeah. So anyway, it's going to take not much It's going to take a lot of cash and that's something as as we just said that the uh, arts community is not known for having tons of. Right. Um so hopefully they can they can find a way to make it work. One way that students are now going to be able to make it work for their own uh, creative projects is USA Projects. If you're not familiar with USA Projects, uh, we've talked about them um, not directly in the past, but they are a crowdfunding site uh, for the arts. They fund music projects, dance projects, uh, theater projects, visual arts, all kinds of things. Um, they're... they're uh, a project of United Artists, 
And um, they're, like I said, crowdfunding, like Kickstarter or Indiegogo, which we've talked about a lot on the show, and we will continue to talk about, I'm sure, for a very long time. Um, but they're a nonprofit, so um, you can uh, tell your, your backers on USA Projects that they can get a tax write-off most of the time. Um, so it's a little bit of a different structure. And for a long time, you had to, it was, it's not open to everybody. Not everybody can make a USA Projects project. And you have to be um, kind of an approved uh, artist. Some, some, in some way, you have to demonstrate that you're a serious professional, I suppose. Uh, now, USA Projects has just announced that their funding is going to be open to students, which uh, are some of the most ambitious and creative uh artists around it's it's um i think easy to imagine students coming up with the sorts of projects that require crowdfunding that are more out in left field than especially when it's the sorts of things that need um monetary support i don't know maybe that's just me what do you think guys sam I think it's great <clears throat> i'm wondering what the disbursement structure is going to be is it the same for students um I mean, because it say they it says they handed out fifty thousand dollar fellowship grants to fifty artists each year. That's a lot of cash. Sure. And, and, and so I'm wondering if that's like you know, could you be a sophomore music composition student who convince them convinces them that you're worthy or whatever, and boom, you get fifty thousand dollars. Well, I mean, it's 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 crowdfunding, so you you have to convince not only USA Projects that your project is worthwhile, but then you need to convince all the people that are going to give you money. And it doesn't matter if you're a sophomore music composition student if you've got a cool project. Sure, I'll give you some money. I don't care. You know. That's, I think that's the beauty of Kickstarter and Indiegogo and USA Projects and crowdfunding as a thing. The beauty is that it is as, as much as it can be a meritocracy, right? Right. So, uh, we're, you know, we're talking about funding any project that we feel is worthy as a, an arts community. Um, so if you guys, if anybody out there wants to get an idea of, what the organization and the people who have funded it think are worthy artists. It's got a list of the different fellows. And some of them are serious. Some of them are like big time people. We talked about the, the cage songbooks project that, um, alarm will sound just wrapped up. They funded part of that through USA projects. So like I'm in a flash flash presentation that shows like a museum sculpture show. And then there was a big production of a stage production of the sound and the fury and then a recording project and on and on and on. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, there's a lot of stuff like that that costs a lot of money for people that are like making physical things, making art pieces. Um, the materials are not cheap for people like us that are, that are putting together performances for theater and dance that are putting together performances. Renting a space for that performance is, is way not cheap. Uh, and, it, you can have a lot of creative ideas but not have the funding to actually pull them off and USA Projects is helping people do that so um, congratulations to them it's something that I certainly wish had been available when I was a student I am I'm jealous of students who can take advantage of this so I can technically still apply <laughs> I suppose do you have to be a student or just a finger quote student still I don't know I don't know are you a finger quote student or an actual student Finger quote student right now. <laughs> but you know what I could still do with my student ID? What's that? Get a rush ticket. Oh, you mean you're going to go see the the prog rock band from the 80s? Uh, no. Also, I have seen them. I, you I can, you can them. use your student ID to get those, right? I wish. No, I did see them back in the 90s during the Roll the Bones tour, and that was not a good album, but... <laughs> You know they don't they don't disappoint. They play all the greatest hits, <clears throat> the big dancing rabbits on stage and everything. Fantastic. No, 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 no. Uh, the 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 Met in New York recently lost the music, the opera community. We should say specifically, we mean the Metropolitan Opera. Yeah, the oh. Metropolitan Opera uh, recently lost, and the opera community in general lost Agnes Veris, who apparently was the benefactor who was holding up the. Uh, Rush ticket program. Which is amazing that somebody, a single person decided that that was important enough that they wanted to fund it themselves. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I just, that oh. just blows my mind. 
that yeah. it, 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 I'm blown away by the generosity. But sorry, and, continue. And to me, that's a very important thing because it's it's tickets. It's not just tickets. It's premium tickets right. that are set aside for students to come and get at a greatly discounted price. <clears throat> and I, I don't, I've never encountered a city that I've gone to school in and like gone and seen an opera that didn't have something like this. Um, and I don't know if this is what inspired everybody to do it, but anyway, it's a, it's a great program and the board has figured out Peter Gelb and the board did something right because he didn't talk about it in public. <laughs> I was just gonna say we we <laughs> rag on Gelb a lot as as not only as a podcast but as a classical music community on the internet. Um, but he really made it a priority to save this, and that's that's very promising. Um, but yeah. he, one of the things that's interesting is he saved it by. Um, He went to some other donors and they got some more donations, but it wasn't enough because obviously a program like this, when you're, when you're giving people, uh, tickets that you could sell for four or $500 for 20 bucks, that's not a cheap program to have. Um, and he decided that it was important enough that he was going to spend some of the, the opera company's regular budget money on, this this rush ticket program so congratulations and thank you peter gelb i know as a person who until very recently had a valid student id i used it to get into a lot of performances that i otherwise would not have been able to afford so i don't know is there is there anything else to say about the 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 rush ticket program at the opera nope so thank anyway. you Met- an opera thanks met opera thanks peter gelb um, and hopefully this is a, is a program that they can continue to afford to have for many, many years. Um, one of the, the great things about having a single person involved is that that single person, um, is, is, is there to kind of maintain that drive, the, the importance. There's a person that's advocating for that specific program. Um, and it's, it's something that, could easily go away so we hope that there's somebody within the met opera organization that is still going to be the the advocate for the rush ticket program going forward um you know, know go ahead sam go ahead one of you <laughs> i can't hear that, what you're saying that was nate but he is his volume has disappeared for some reason I was just saying that I, I hope that people continue to use these as well. So everybody go check out. The yes. Opera. <laughs> if, you're in, if you're ever in New York and you want to go see the opera, take advantage of their rush ticket program so that they know that it's something that people find valuable. <laughs> if you don't look 14 years older than your student ID picture, then if you're smart, you still carry in your wallet to get movie cheap tickets. tickets have you. That's movie right. tickets, man. That's Sell them right. out every time. So, Dave, you know, it's a shame that uh, Patrick is not here this week. I know. Patrick Pat, Patrick had a crazy idea that he shared with us after the show last week. I don't know if we were still streaming when, when we talked about this. But Patrick wanted to start a radio station. Yes. Uh, but one place he wouldn't be able to, well, he, he'd have some competition doing that would be in Philadelphia. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Sam. What were you going to say about the Philadelphia uh, well, Radio. that's what I was going to say, Dave. So thanks for... I stole your thunder. You have all the power, and you can change my camera whenever you want. That's and right. I was going to say, that's There's, fine. See, see so, what I did there? You're gone now. You're you're dead to me. So so I think since you're Mr. Know-it-all, Mr. Total Control, you should talk about it. Besides, okay. you, said, you said this guy is your hero. <laughs> I have the, the button controls. Um... <laughs> Anyway, so the, the there is classical music returning to the radio in Philadelphia. Um, the uh, station is WWFM FM um, is is uh, striking out on a new digital channel. Uh, if you, so, unfortunately, you need an HD radio, which I don't think I have in my car. Um, HD radio, hybrid digital radio is like, if you've, if you've seen, seen like, um, the two, like the second version of, uh, a radio station, they can have a three and a four, but the audio on the three and the four isn't so hot usually. Um, but they can have like a second 
channel within their frequency with the digital radio. And so WWFM is taking that opportunity to create a new classical radio station. This is, a, I think, a public radio station in Philadelphia. And um, it's been around uh, for about 30 years, and they're, they're, they're making a new push with their classical radio station, and they want to not play kind of the top 40 classical kind of stuff all the time. They they want to play a, an adventurous program of people you may not have heard before, people that may not be very easy to listen to. Um, and the the station manager is my hero because he says, this is a quote um, from this article in the Philadelphia Inquirer, uh, at least on their webpage, I assume it appeared in print, uh, Station manager Peter Fretwell. The day I walk into an o- a doctor's office and hear WWFM is the day we've failed, unless the doctor happens to be a serious aficionado. Our goal is not to be played as background music. If it's art, it deserves full attention front and center. Damn straight. Yeah. <laughs> well, see, that's I agree with that too. But like Patrick's big argument, since we're couching this in terms of Patrick. <laughs> Uh, who's not here to defend himself that's right (laughs) which he was just admitting that he was wrong by not showing up we can say um the the big point about radio and he was right is that the audience you get through having them and being in their car now it being hd radio nullifies that to begin with but even if they you know everybody a lot of cars a lot of new cars have hd radios well, let's say that that's a non-factor. Even that being a non-factor, if it's art and it deserves full attention, that sort of precludes listening to it in your car. And sure, as we sure. all know anyway, listening to classical music, um, unless it's some kind of really loud, pulse-driven minimalism, you know, I mean, like you could listen to Workers' Union maybe in your car, but typically <laughs> classical music has a huge amount of uh, dynamic variation that just makes it really really impossible to give it that kind of listening they're suggesting in your car. That's so, that's true, but the car is not the only place to listen to the radio, right? I mean, I know that's the way most people listen to radio, and people aren't gathered around their transistor radios in their living room listening to music anymore, but you could, you, you could do that. Well, not your transistor radio and get the digital station, but you could do that, and and you know, with most of these radio stations, they're also streaming on the web, especially these um, kind of second and third and fourth tier digital stations are almost always streaming on the web because so many people in the United States don't have it. Now, if you're listening to this in Europe or somewhere else where the the frequency bands are a little bit more crowded and um, the, 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 the digital stations, those hybrid digital second and third and fourth stations are more common, most cars do have the the op, the that option, but in the U.S. it's still not super common. What were you gonna say, Nate? I well, so listening to online, that was what I was wondering: is if that was available, then that would be an obvious choice for me. I know I used to listen a lot to the Q2 online station as I was listening, or like working on electronics in my basement, and where I'd be in the same place for a long time and be interested in hearing art and like not have the background noise of a car or like some other loud work environment. Yeah. Nick, can you get a little closer to your mic? Did you hear any of that? I, I heard most of it. It was just a little in and out. Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think you're, you're absolutely right. Cause we do listen to Q2. I certainly listen to a lot of web radio throughout the day. Uh, listen to Q2, listen to counter stream radio from mm-hmm. AMC and new music box. If, if so you should check out those two, if you do web radio and then when you, when you're, when you get a little start to get a little bored with those guys, add WWFM to your rotation. There you go. Um, so that's a very cool project. Um, and, uh, we, we th- thank them for that and, I'll certainly be tuning into WWFM in the coming weeks. Um, I have no uh, artful segue into this next story, <laughs> but it's Sam's favorite. Well, I was just looking for some stuff this morning, and I came across a, uh, <laughs> I want to say sad, because just the imagery makes me sad. I don't think I could help myself when you see pianos being just hurtled off the back end of a truck. Um the story is about basically uh, talking about 
the place that pianos have in contemporary culture and contemporary economic culture. Um, even though pianos are an expensive item these days, it's uh, like especially for upright pianos. The the article makes the point. It's it's a it's burden. Like, it's become a disposable product. Basically, people have a piano around for a while, and you know, Dave, you made the point. You look in the ad, one ads in a city, and it'll say free upright piano. Just move it. You know, yeah, so it's a just big get this piece. thing out of my house. It requires a highly trained specialized specialized technician to get work done on it, and it's very expensive. Um, <clears throat> you know, there's all it's, kinds. I of wouldn't things. say that it's very expensive. If you play it as much as like normal people play a piano in their homes, you can get away with tuning it every other year. Yeah. You know, but don't still, you think? And like that cost. If you get a really crazy expensive tuner. At least I don't know. Maybe it's changed a lot, but like you may, might spend a couple hundred bucks every other year. Yeah, but but that suggests somebody who makes enough use of that piano for them to think that tuning it every two years is even worth the money to do that. Sure. I when, mean, I mean, my parents have a piano, and I don't know the last. Time. I think it's been at least five or six years since they've had it tuned. Yeah, I mean, same with my parents. I'm sure, and but having that piano growing up is like the only reason I do music these days. So right. Right. So, uh, but people, I think, in, in, in those situations, in a lot of cases, are moving towards um, electronic solutions. And, and, and electric pianos are getting better all the time, and good electric pianos are getting cheaper all the time. Which yeah, I feel the same. <laughs> I know it doesn't feel the same, but if you're seven, you don't care. If, right? if, if Sir Elton John can, get perfect, <laughs> can give a convincing, like, two hour concert of his music, which we can all agree is certainly piano based and he doesn't use a real piano most of the time these days he can get up there and go through a whole litany of elton john songs on an electric piano and it sounds acceptable to our ears i think that's the the lesson you know you can have something that's the same or less than an actual piano that sounds you know eh, but you can also plug headphones into it so i don't know it's you know it's not it's not like a required item in contemporary culture it's you know, that's right. This. I mean, it used to be like a standard thing. Like, like you go into any home today, there's a television in the living room. You go into any home 60, 70 years ago, there's a piano in the living room. Or some um, Hammond organ. And somebody who knows how to play it, <laughs> you know? Not just the piano, but people who understand how to make it work, at least on a rudimentary level. And we don't have either of those really anymore in, in any common sense. Which is yeah. like... People don't necessarily gather around their their home organ and sing choir tunes and stuff. Sure, though I totally would. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, the the uh, the metaphor in this case is painted perhaps a little too thick to use it as a jumping off point for the kind of things we talk about <laughs> all the time on the show. So I'll leave that up to the audience. Imagine the 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 things that you might think how this symbolizes things about you know music education or the the arts in this country or whatever and. And and just have that dialogue yourself. Mm -hmm. It's a little too obvious for just, me. Just imagine it, you know. Just imagine it in your head. You know, you hear the the voices of bourgeois America from the 1950s in your head. There you go. But I do encourage you, and we'll have a link to watch the video. It's an interesting mm -hmm. story. It's a, it's basically like a, a little micro uh, documentary about this company, the oh hell. Not have that kind of language, Sam. <laughs> Uh, well, anyway, it's a, a piano moving company and, oh, the Meehan, Meehan Piano Movers, movers. Uh, and he's talking about how this, the guy that they're interviewing had been doing it since the mid seventies and talking about how there used to be lots of deliveries and now it's a lot of get rid of, um, anyway, so it was an interesting story. And if you just watch it, it's just, it's cringe inducing to me to watch grand pianos and stuff just being hurtled out of the back of a truck and then smashed up by a piece of heavy equipment. Yeah. And if you're interested in rescuing a piano, uh, this guy has actually started a, uh, if I had remember this right, the, the guy, the uh, Meehan Piano Movers Company has started a piano called, pian uh, and a, a website, website. pianoadoption.com. And it has it separated by state, and I clicked on Michigan, and I'm looking at tons of uh, free come pick it up pianos cool. with picture in most cases. So if you want to, if you want a piano, the resource is out there. So keep the tradition alive, 
get yourself a four hands arrangement of something and you know, <laughs> still not cheap. Front. I don't know how much it would cost for me to get a piano moved. I, I'm in a third floor apartment, uh, and I'm certainly not going to get the thing up here. <laughs> but yeah. I don't know how much it would cost to get one moved in and tuned. <laughs> but you it's, know, I'm sure more than I have. Well, an upright piano seems like a small thing, and and, and uh, but anyone out there like I have who's tried to lift with a crew of guys. An upright piano, it's still very, 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 very heavy. The, the, the iron harp thing is ridiculous. Yep. So, that's... Pussy Riot! <laughs> Sam? <laughs> Are you <My> okay? <laughs> well, giving, us, giving us an excuse to talk about Pussy Riot again this week is Frank J. O'Terry. Um, so we get to say Pussy Riot again this week is what you're saying. We do. We get to say Pussy Riot again this week. Mm-hmm. Um, he has a new uh, posting at New Music Box this week um, about sort of the uh, the Pussy Riot uh, incident. Phenomenon? Phenomenon. Yeah, well, that's what it is. That's kind of the point that it is a phenomenon. Um, he's got links to... It's basically about uh, the, the articles uh, getting working its way around to posing the question, um, since this is like the only one of the only stories that has anything to do with music that has hit the mega mainstream news. How do we use this notoriety um, to spread the word about, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, making sure that uh, society stay free to uh, and open to uh, artistic expression, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it also has some interesting links about how uh, like, about how the the story might be contextualized in Russia. How most people, most of your average citizens in Russia agree with the ruling and how like they have their the article says a world famous band with a six song oeuvre. Like they have six songs that they've produced that you can get and now they're world famous and everybody knows who they are and everybody's saying we support them. Sure, but they're also in jail for 2 years. Yes. How are they going to take advantage of their newfound fame? Well, according to, according to the descriptions of how they were, they they're ready to take their two years uh, with with pride because they were still defiant when the verdict was being handed down. And think about when they get out too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so Frank, they got a big show planned in Berkeley. Yeah. So Terry is asking the question. Um, I'll leave it. I'll ask it the way he asks it. Um, As in the as the only mega news story in the mainstream media that has any connection to music, how can we channel this broad range of public support into overall support for creative expression and ensuring that it is properly respected and nurtured all over the world? Dave, take it away. (laughs) What? That's. Hmm. I think that's kind of my response too. Like, what? I, I I mean, I don't see what classical music has to do with this, and I don't. I don't mean, he says in 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 the article somewhere, like this is kind of not exactly the uh, purview of this publication, <laughs> but I think it's interesting, so I'm going to write about it, which is great. That's how that's how internet publication should be. Um, well, I felt I inspired to I talk about his piece, not because I'm like, yes, I, because my my feeling was, huh? Yeah. Like, uh, but I do have some thoughts on it. I mean, I think it's interesting. I don't really feel that strongly about it. Well, I think the point should be made that it is only barely, barely a music story at all, really. Right. I mean, they could be architecture students who did something that along the same lines where they protested protested in a church and they're going to prison for it. And I think I would feel the same as far as freedom of expression and that kind of thing. But them being a punk band, it it makes me have them a little respect for as a punk band because they're doing something that's punk, but the, the overarching idea they could be any kind of art form and the repression that's going along is the story. Not so much that it's music. Sure. Especially Mm -hmm. not in the way that we on the show being highbrow music people talk about music. Yeah. Have either of you ever made a piece that would have been like in danger of being censored for anything? Um, I, Sam, I, I've intentionally used pieces that, uh, and put them out there to be heard publicly that violate copyright <laughs> sort of, you know, using unapproved samples as a way to sort of see if anybody knows or cares or says anything about it. 
but not the only reason because they sound cool but you know not backing away just using whatever the bloop, bloop, i want you know and, and to see, see that's it. how much sam doesn't care about getting censored is that he will censor himself right <laughs> So anyway, you know, I've made some creative projects that way, and I've also just done some sort of generic projects on YouTube that do the same thing. And I've got a a, 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 a Thanksgiving family video that uses the Beatles in the background, and it's been up there for like two years, and I still haven't gotten a notice to take it down. Yeah, I, YouTube just told me, I think a couple of days ago, that they they finally realized that this Meshuggah song I've got in one of my videos is like, okay, a yeah, it's not good. We're not <laughs> yeah. going to take it down. But. That's what they do now. They they yeah. they just put their ads on it. Right. So how about you, Dave? I mean, I've gotten we get YouTube content ID notices every time I post an episode of Streamers and Punches that you know because it's big name stuff. Like you can't put music from a Hans Zimmer score on YouTube without somebody noticing. But I mean, that's not really the point. That's not what we're talking about. I don't think I've done any. I don't think I've written any music that. Uh, it would evoke any kind of political reaction or even a social reaction from anybody. And maybe that's a failing of, of me as a composer. I certainly, I, I mean, I know there are people that would say that it is, um, but um, that's not really something I'm interested in. Well, if you're writing, absolute- I mean, I'm interested in politics and social issues. I'm just not interested in messing with them in my music. And again, maybe that's a personal failure. I, mean, I think everybody gets different things out of their art and, Sure. That doesn't necessarily need to be what you push. Sure. What, what you push your ideas through. And, and you know, I've only written a, a small handful of pieces that have a text, and as, as we have said on the show many times, it's hard to to do anything extra musical without a text or or a ballet or something like that, something visual. I think composers can can do something that's sort of, you know, punk in a way in the new music by scene. writing parallel bits. <laughs> well, by Take doing that things. freshman theory, prof. Ooh. That that demands an, an aesthetic point of view that maybe is, you know, like people consider like certain kinds of experimental music is past its prime, you know, and then you do a piece on a serious recital where you're really asking people to seriously, you know, recalibrate their aesthetic point of view and along the lines of a cage piece or something. Doing that now can be a pretty brave, in its own uh, sort of domain, politically brave um, thing to do. Okay. Eh. But the consequences are so, like, you know... Yeah. So, doctor, like, you're not going to be put in jail for that. Dr. Yeah, So-and-so yeah. thinks you're a hack now. That's, like, the worst uh, repercussion of this. You're certainly not going to get thrown in jail. Get yeah. 30 frowns at, at worst, yeah. <laughs> now, if I could write a piece that was so ugly and alienating in this country that it got me thrown in jail, that would be something. I don't know no, what, yes. what that piece would be. I don't know. Maybe hack into a public address system somewhere. Probably some choir. Yeah, you'd have to. It would. It would have to involve breaking some other law. Yeah, I think Guar already did that kind of thing. (laughs) (laughs) So, uh, is it time to uh, to get to our pick of the week, Sam? That's nice. That was a little different from last time. I like it. Um, so our pick of the week this week, we don't have a piece of music for you, but we do have a new, um, I don't know what you would call this, a new feature, perhaps, of Sound Notion. Um, we uh, finally f- figured out how to make a cool playlist on Spotify that we can all share. Um, so if you go to Spotify, we'll have links to this in, in our show notes and maybe we'll put it somewhere real prominent that it'll stay obvious all the time. Um, we're, we're starting a playlist on Spotify that we're calling sound notion radio for lack of a better term. If we can return to the, to our, our radio meme. Um, and here on sound notion radio, we're going to have links to, um, pieces by, uh, our, uh, uh, guests on the show and some past picks of the week and um, just music that we think is cool and that you might be interested in checking out. So if you uh, go to our site and click that link, anybody can get on Spotify now, at least in the US and Europe. Um, it, there's a free version of it. Um, so you don't you don't have to pay for it. Uh, you will have ads if you're not paying for it, but I think that's a small price to pay for their huge library. Um so check it out, Sound Notion Radio. Um, 
and you can you can listen to all kinds of cool stuff for free. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Who doesn't like free? Sam likes free, <laughs> right? Sam, you like free? Sam, say that again. Free ninety nine. Sorry, <laughs> you you were being gated out by Skype, <laughs> and I wanted to make sure you got the opportunity to shout that. Anytime anybody says free around Sam, he says free ninety nine. So you you all got that experience just now. I'm just quoting Kanye. Sure. Always good. And, and what would an episode of Sound Notion be without a Kanye quote? And we'll leave you with that Kanye quote today. That's going to do it for this week's Sound Notion. Um, thank you so much for joining us, those of you that were watching live. We stream this show live every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. You can check that out at soundnotion.tv slash live. We have a chat room there, and we're always watching the chat. So if you have any questions or any comments that you want to bring up, uh, you can do that there. Um, when we have guests, if you have a question that you want to make sure we ask the guest, uh, you can feel free to, to bring that up in there and you can get your questions answered by whoever our awesome guest is. Um, you can also, of course, leave comments on the show after the fact. If you're listening to this recording, we appreciate that as well. Um, and you can leave us a note at soundnotion.tv slash SN uh, and leave us a note there. You can also connect with us on Facebook or Twitter. We're at Sound Notion on Twitter. This show and all our shows are available in the iTunes store, so be sure to go there, subscribe for free, and get every episode downloaded automatically to your device. Sound Notion's introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Lap. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you back next week. <laughs>